and against everybody's better judgment and his better judgment, he dragged himself out of here after a really harrowing hospital visit yesterday to read to you, Anthony Marnetti. Just like, uh, just like I did with Jason, I made a request. Anthony's a writer too, and I asked him to read one of my favorite stories of this. The bullfrog in the swamp near my house was humongous. He was black, long-legged, and faster than imagination. I suppose we called it the swamp because it was a stagnant, scum-coated pool of water even though it was only a bit larger than your ordinary suburban home footprint. Sparsely wooded land and rocks big enough to climb up on surrounded it. There was plenty of scrub vegetation and vines were hanging here and there. It lay in the middle of the next lot over where one day a large house would stand. But from 1957, when I came across it until 1963, it served as our rainforest, animal refuge, scenes for black lagoon monster fantasies, and the center of our wildlife experiences. In short, it was the other side of the world, 60 feet from the house. All of us neighborhood kids and our dogs went there alone and in packs to see salamanders, their clear ribbons of eggs, tadpoles, garter snakes, toads, snapping turtles, and the fish we referred to as carp. We'd go there to poke sticks, toss rocks, and especially to meditate on Bullfrog. He was around every spring, Bullfrog was, and all summer, and a good part of each fall. And legend held that in winter he retired to the mud on the swamp floor where he'd suspend himself under the ice cover, growing larger in silent darkness, still impenetrable, employing the mad yogic skills that we'd heard about until March, just after the arrival of the brave crocuses, when he'd reappear to mystify and delude us for another season. You could never get too near him. It was, it was as if he had a scanner somewhere on the lot. He'd leap virtually before the first sound of a footstep crackling, and you'd hear the boop, followed by a parting and closing of green slime. Sometimes, if you'd been there a while, you might catch a glimpse of his eyes piercing the surface. Usually, um, you'd only see his entirety in mid-flight from the swamp's edge, fully extended for an instant before he'd slip beneath the murk. And you counted yourself fortunate to have had such a vision. I respected him in a strange way and was also a little afraid of him. There's something to do with the sensational chasm between us. He represented a tremendous mystery, and I was awed by the namelessness of what I sometimes felt. Though he was wholly and totally other, I felt connected to him. To say nothing of the fact that, that, that he lived next door. It was his spot, his place on the other side of the world, in what I had embraced as a part of my world. And he kept it in his, under his quiet control and discretion, 
living a silent and contemplative life, shrouded in his damp and shadowy monastery. Conversations over those summers as we whiled away hours on the swamp banks often went like this. Hey, did you see Bullfrog yet? <laughs> nah, but almost. Yeah, me too. Danny Tootin says he touched him yesterday. What? <laughs> he's lying. <laughs> yeah, he's lying. <laughs> and so on. Catching bullfrog was a fantasy many of us had, the way catching a troll or a unicorn may have been for some, or seeing Bigfoot or an alien or the Loch Ness Monster was for others. I don't think I truly wanted to capture him. It was for me a magnificent dream that I wanted to remain a dream, the kind that if you wake from is gone, never to return in the same way. And I wanted to dream to remain in my youthful, languid summer slumber. And I needed Bullfrog and the Swamp to lay there with me, restful in contented lethargy. Inevitably, kids fell off the rocks and into the swamp at least a few times each summer. You couldn't really drown unless you were like two years old and panicked. <laughs> forgetting that the water was probably not all the way over your head. <laughs> Except if you landed in the very middle of, what the heck were you doing there anyway? <laughs> Those immersions were badges of merit and holy rites of passage. You'd hear kids say, even years later, I fell in once. <laughs> it was weird. <laughs> The swamp was a sort of turned around fountain of youth. Once you went into it, you aged, or at least your soul got older. Perhaps it was a kind of baptism by fire, reserved for us by Brother Bullfrog. One summer afternoon, some big kids I didn't know, there were three of them, were at the swamp when I arrived, and they had just caught Bullfrog. To me, it was as if, they, as if they had discovered Atlantis. I clicked into overdrive. Hey, that's the frog. <laughs> I said, astonished and practically disoriented. No shit, Sherlock. <laughs> One of the boys answered. Wow, can I see him? You got eyes, you can see him. He was not so dark after all, but a deep and vibrant green with large teenage hands around his belly. He had stretched himself right out, and man, if he wasn't 18 inches long. I, I was already hypnotized when the boys began walking away from the swamp with him towards my house, which was odd to me because I, I didn't know them and doubted they even knew it was my yard they were walking into. I wondered why they'd be taking him anywhere. Well, well what you doing? I asked, eager but somewhat agitated to be part of this momentous and auspicious occasion. Just watch, one of them said authoritatively. They set Bullfrog down at the bottom edge of my front yard, and when I saw him there out of his place and against the green of the grass, he seemed to change. Darker again, like in the water, but now smaller and stone still never attempting a getaway, not the slightest effort to spring into flight as was his typical course of action. Perhaps, I imagined, he was employing his wintertime competencies, his yogic trance, remaining in deep reserve. P perhaps it was something else that kept him there, maybe some of that deep and distant knowledge I suspected he possessed or possibly the same thing that held me there, as the boys hurriedly fumbled with their pockets. I could barely wrench my eyes from him and only briefly glanced in the direction of the three others. Before I knew what was happening, one of them had forced open Bullfrog's mouth and jammed in a firecracker.
frog remained ever motionless, accepting, apparently peaceful. He might have been in shock, but he just stood there in a wide stance looking stable and strong. Now I was gripped with anxiety. My legs shook. I felt woozy, but I knew I had to act. Hey! I started to move forward. Hey, what? Well, what are you going to do, I asked, stopped in my tracks. What do you think, jerk off? No, don't, I croaked. Who is this fucking kid? One of the others asked. Never mind him, his friend said, as they bent to their task. Hey, wait, I blurted out impotently. Shut up, one shouted, and I did. And the match was lit and put to the wick. I didn't fly to pull it out. I didn't yell for my mother. I didn't shout for help. I didn't fight for what I knew was right. I didn't do anything. I stood by, mute, frozen, afraid, and stupid, and it went off. Bullfrog's head jerked up and then came back with stunning speed. His mouth blew wide open, but he remained still, his eyes fixed straight ahead. I didn't know if he was dead standing there. I didn't know what was happening to him or me. The sound of the blast was deafening. Bullfrog's mouth remained hanging open. The aftershock and shrieking and hoo-hahs of the boys started coming in and hurt my head. I felt the sounds all through me now and thought I was going to fall right down there or throw up. And I raced back to the swamp dissociated, smashing blind through the brambles. I hid by the rocks on the other side of the swamp, choking back my shame and rage-filled tears. On a low rock holding my head, I saw my face reflected in the water darkly. Time passed, but to, to me it just hung there, not moving, not stopped, as I wildly thought about what I should have done. When I returned to my yard, there was no sign of the big kids or bullfrog. I frantically searched the spot on the grass and saw shreds of paper and a tiny impression where the detonation had occurred. I stumbled around confused and queasy. I wanted to believe that he was okay and had taken off, hiding himself in the bushes, waiting for his time to go home. But I felt a sinking and certain knowledge that they had carried his shocked and injured body away to do it again somewhere else in order to finalize the deed to get what they wanted from him, his suffering and his life. If he wasn't dead yet, I knew that soon he would be. And I also knew that I had been awakened and the dream was over. No more youth, no more summer sleep, the bell had rung for me now, but this one did not call me home and soon I would have no choice but to climb through the ropes and into the war. I was too ashamed to tell anyone, afraid they'd ask what I did and why I didn't. My head hung down inside me after that near a heart which leaked and burned. I hid, I hid because I let them I let them wake me, I let them take me, I handed myself over to them, and so I hid. And now, half a century later, I carry his weight and meditate on him still. His sacrifice and my lack of strength contributed to my fantasy of becoming an avenging angel, protecting the helpless, coming to the rescue of the disenfranchised, standing up against abuses of power. I tried to do these things, but not frequently and seldom well. In fact, most often I have had regrets about the parts I've played, overreacting unnecessarily and inappropriately, or when real action was called for, freezing, never enough, not enough to rinse the guilt from my hands. Five years after Bullfrog's passing, a Buddhist monk self-immolated in Southeast Asia on June 11, 1963, in a protest against the brutal oppression 
by the Catholic regime in power in Vietnam. The monk had prepared for months in meditation and at a busy intersection his fellow monks poured gasoline on him and he lit the match. It was an act of tremendous courage and a sign to the world that he and his brothers could withstand any pain for the sake of his people. It was the most powerful image I had ever seen and it brought back the stalwart and resolute figure of Bullfrog standing firm in the face of his oppressors. And it also recalled my passivity in the face of his courage. The story goes that even after the incident, though he was cremated in Buddhist tradition, his heart would still not burn and is therefore considered holy and has since been in the custody of the Reserve Bank of Vietnam. This was the strength and power Bullfrog demonstrated to me in my boyhood. The passion and empathy evoked in me by him and the monk was unforgettable, immeasurable, bottomless. The monk who gave his life was a hero to me, as was Bullfrog before him. And so the swamp was irrevocably transformed for me on that my 10th summer. But I continued to visit, sitting on the rocks at its edge for years after, staring at the water, seeing my changing face reflected back as I did on that day when I first saw my shame and sorrow in the swamp's mirror. In speaking with my brother about those days, he said, you know, a lot of the swamps still existed even after the McAllisters built their house on that lot. More than half of the swamp was still out in their backyard. Then they built their swimming pool and that killed the rest of it. A moment later he said, hey, I wonder where it is, the swamp. It's got to be under there somewhere, no? Yeah, I replied, it's good. It's got to be. I did not mention that although the swamp itself is gone, I keep it with me, my piece of the other side of the world. Perhaps I hang on to it in the hope that it will prevent my heart from burning up. And I have maintained my position on the rocks. The picture in the water continues to be my dark reflections, of which I seem tireless. But since that summer, in the swamp, swims an image of bullfrog, which from time to time extends into full view, breaking the still surface, disturbing the static reflection, contorting and twisting it until it becomes more real, more me. In memoriam, Bullfrog. Summer 1958. Tick Kong Duck, summer 1960.